we're interviewing Murray Camper. Murray is an IT god in the Tyler Longview, Texas radio market. Murray's been at Alpha, Alpha Media since 2015, and he's been asking radio folks like myself, have you rebooted the computer for a lot longer? Now, for today's episode at least, Mandy and Murray are at the clubhouse. I'm on Zoom at home. My back has been giving it to me. So let's get going on UMS number 20. Okay, here we go. Test, 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 test. Roll music? Let's roll it. Welcome to the Unknown Morning Show. It's the show where we explore radio, podcasting, TV, gear, gearheads, and making money with a hot mic and other stuff too. This is the Unknown Morning Show. I'm Mandy Montana. And I'm Chuck McKinley. I mean, it, it would be hilarious if you guys were actually in the building. Oh, I know. Just right down. Just a couple it's of two doors. doors down. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder who's there. I wonder if the tower is still out back. I don't I'm know sure they took it down. about the tower, but I think uh, Robert Dodd, Promo okay. Media, okay. is who is actually in that yeah. building. There may be some other offices in there, yeah. too, though, because it's a pretty big space. Yeah. A lot of hours in that building. Chuck, I think you, uh, were you on the ranch? I yeah. Was, yeah, I was there. That was, man, what I remembered about that, I was in a production area that was like four by four. Mm-hmm. Sure. And <laughs> and it was, oh, yeah, yeah. It I was tight. But, and remember, the studio was probably the size of the maybe, Mandy's Clubhouse. Yeah. <clears throat> or oh no! About no. Half, about half, half the size. Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh no! We we would have ki- we would have killed for Mandy's Clubhouse. Mm-hmm. It was probably it seemed like it was what um, six by probably ten. It just seemed really really dinky. That's the one Tom started in when he started doing his show. Mm-hmm. In I town, guess I but- just remember it favor favorably because that was my first full time gig. So I'd been in Longview forever, and then I was came okay. to. I didn't Chase remember Drive. that. I didn't remember. Yeah, that. May two thousand five. My gosh, you have a yeah. good memory. What? So, what shift did you do? Middays. Okay. I took right. over for Amy because a- it was after Access One acquired us. So Amy okay. and Charlie O moved over to Sunny right. in the mornings, right? And then Matt filled in for a while. Okay. On middays, hmm. and then kind of held my spot open for me, and then yeah. I rolled into middays, probably in part because Chuck. Yeah. Because he heard me on Sunday afternoons on Kicks and was like. She has promise. She knows how to say it, the call letters, which was a big deal. Yeah, which was a, well, what's a big deal? And and I'll say this real quick because this is the classic of all classics. So, um, they have the weekly program. They would have weekly program director meetings. This is before I was PD and Bob Malden was. Mm-hmm. So Tom's in there with Bob and Ginger and everybody. Blah blah blah. And Tom goes, "Hey, what do you think about us getting that little girl of yours come to come over here and do middays?" Oh my God, their hair caught on fire. It was just, yeah, I would have loved to have seen it. I was down the hall. My hair caught on fire shortly after that. (laughs) When, (laughs) when Drew came around the corner, he's like, what you're interviewing? Like it it blew his mind. It just never crossed his mind that I would have an interest in going to work full time in Tyler. But I would have thought, yeah, yeah. But Murray, where were you full time then? Because I remembered you came over to kicks. Whenever I was part time, you and Sands would sometimes come over and do some work in the control room when I was right. there. But were you in Jacksonville or Tyler? Yeah, yeah, Jacksonville. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's so interesting how um, I don't I don't recall a lot of shift changes like you going on the ranch. Yeah, I was so involved in the backside, the back mm-hmm. end of things that that I I really don't have a lot of memories of who was on, you know, what station. Well, that's not what when. you were doing day to day. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, I probably encountered you many times, but mm-hmm. my focus was so um, singular that um, that I probably didn't take a whole lot of time to chat with you. I was probably the annoying person trying to chat with you and Sands because I'd been in the room by myself for oh, hours. Yes. And then there's yeah. people. And then somebody shows up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was in Jacksonville for sure. Okay. So. Uh, a lot of road miles mm-hmm. to Longview and Tyler. Yeah. Uh, of course, I was in Tyler, uh, living in Tyler. So I was, I was, I was like so many others, like Dave, that drove to Jacksonville every day mm-hmm. and and really wore in that road, um, doing that. And then coming over here into this so small of office on Chase Drive uh, to to assist, we were really good at installing studios and production rooms and closets uh, because that's all we had available. <laughs> that's true. Uh, it was uh, it was always after the fact. Um, it was it was um, it was the stations bought, the stations acquired. We're putting the station on the air, uh, set it up somewhere. You know, mm-hmm. it was it was never designed. 
um, ahead of time. It was always just a, you know, just an afterthought. And so that's why so many studios were in closets like Invasora as well. Yeah. Invasora was built out in literally a closet in Jacksonville. I, I thought yeah. so. Chuck and I were trying to remember the building on Chase Drive. We talked about, I remembered the production room being in a closet because mm-hmm. I worked in it, mm-hmm. but I thought I remembered Scooby working in a closet mm-hmm. over there too. Like right. Sunny had the big giant yes. studio with windows and right. face the front. And then, right. you know, the ranch and Invasora were kind of tucked in and yeah. little areas wherever we could fit. Yeah. And it really has continued um, with the whole closet mindset and has radio. Um, yeah. With studios getting smaller and smaller. I mean, there's mm-hmm. less equipment. I mean, that's true. The reason Sunny had such a large studio is because when it was built out, it had a lot of equipment in there, a lot of technology. Mm-hmm. It had three, three full size racks off to the side, um, plus the console, uh, plus all the equipment around the console. So it needed a lot of room, uh, but a lot of thought was put into it. Dudley was really proud of that building, uh, rightfully so. I never got to see the Jacksonville building. Did you not? You never, no, you never, I never went down there. You I never, never were summoned mm-hmm. for a meeting. No. That's right, because no. you weren't in sales. If you were in sales, you would have been summoned for a meeting. Right, and I was not a full-time employee until, right. I, really, right. until about the time Access One acquired mm-hmm. The stations. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it was it, a strange timeline for me. Sorry, Chad. No, 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 no. I was going to say, it, it, I visited once and I thought, this is the cleanest radio station I've ever seen in my life. You know, mm-hmm. it was, and, and then David told us during his interview, there was like um, um, individual uh, shoe mats outside mm-hmm. of each studio. Yep, that's and the correct. whole nine yards. Yeah, that's wow. correct. Yeah, it was and that that was all because of Dudley. Uh, I give him credit for that. 100%. And that was something that he had discipline for every day and really made sure that we all uh, met that bar mm-hmm. every day. And it would be frustrating because I'd be in the middle of a project or Sands would be in the middle of a project and we'd have some stuff laid out and he'd want us to pick it up at the end of the day, even oh. if we were going to come back yeah. and continue on it the next morning. He wanted us to pick it up and put it put it away just like we were playing with toys or something. Uh, but it wasn't always that easy to do. Right. Um, and so uh, for him, uh, you know, it was almost to a fault, though, uh, where it was um, form over function. That's really what, okay. what, what that's the phrase that Sands and I ended up kind of coining uh, as it relates to Dudley's mindset is that as long as it looked good, it didn't he he didn't care so much about the function of it. He wanted it to look good. <laughs> as long as the outcome was what he yes, wanted. Yes, yeah. And yeah. he but, but he really didn't have any kind of understanding. No, he didn't. He of didn't the have ins and outs, no, right? No, no, cuz he was old school. Uh, yeah. um uh I mean it, yeah, there was just so much that was over his head in terms of the technology. And that's true for for his generation, not just mm-hmm. him, you know, everybody. Tom was the same way. Yeah. You know. I mean the jock in the box, he really disliked automation <laughs> um, he did. Uh, Dudley embraced it but I think it was more so I well I wouldn't say he embraced it it was more so that uh, he just didn't really ask a lot of questions about it because he didn't understand it mm-hmm. so he was just quiet about things like that yeah. which was okay. just so it worked right yeah yeah it was it was all about the outcome but it, it, it had to look good it mm-hmm. had to look good um, and so there were many of times that um I helped him straighten pictures on the walls in the hallways. Really? Yeah. Mm Non-technical. He would come get me. Can you help me uh, adjust these pictures on the wall? Because they're not, they're not straight. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or adjust the the times on the clocks. He had clocks in the conference room Uh for each time zone. Um, I don't know. There might've been eight clocks, eight time zones. Wow. Across the, across the globe. They were analog clocks. Okay. um, Because there was no other option. They didn't uh, GPS sync or anything. They were they were just running off AA batteries. That's a difficult thing to mm-hmm. keep those in sync. Mm-hmm. But that was a priority for him. And so, wow. If it wasn't myself, it was Drew Bush. Uh, it was Sands. It was whoever was available to go in there and adjust the time on those clocks <laughs> to be wow. accurate. What an yeah. idiosyncrasy! Like the the details, right? You know? uh, yes, yeah, yeah. And that was the way it was across the whole. Uh, the whole plant down mm-hmm. there. Um, and, it, you know, Dave has one of those clocks. Oh, um, does he? I had one until it finally just stopped. And I really didn't, I didn't want to keep it just, uh, you know, just as a pitcher, for mm-hmm. instance. But 
when um, when KVE took over those stations, uh, Sands and I went down there and got all the equipment that we wanted. Oh, that's and that was nice. kind of a walk down memory lane for yeah, us because we had spent so many hours in that building. I didn't um, realize they took over that building. Uh, they didn't take over the building, but they took the state. They purchased okay. the stations and the assets. And so we had the opportunity to go down there and 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 get whatever it is that we wanted. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to get a couple of those clocks uh, because I thought that would be something really unique. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I gave one to Dave. He put it in his office over at uh, over at Reynolds. Uh, And it's still there uh, to this day. I think it may still work. That one may still work. But they were really old school office clocks. Uh, They were very I wouldn't say unique, but but uh, but you just don't see them very often. You don't see those analog clocks Mm -hmm. anymore. Um, and that was probably why it didn't work for very long. Uh, but anyway, yeah, Jacksonville, a lot of, uh, a lot of hours spent in that building that used to be a morgue, uh, if I remember correctly. It was a morgue before it was a radio station? Well, uh, I think at some point it was a bank because it, okay. it had a vault uh, mm-hmm. in, in the traffic office where Shelly was, for instance. Um, but then also, yeah, somebody, somebody had confirmed this, that when the school exploded, where was that? What city was that? Uh, New London. Yeah, when New London yes. uh, took place, they brought a lot of the the uh, the victims to that location. Wow! In fact, there's it, there's one of the studios. It was the Kiwi Studio that the floor sloped, so you could tell there used to be a drain oh, in that yeah. studio because the floor sloped to the middle, and and so that was really the story that that we were told was that that, that was a funeral home or a morgue or whatever. Whatever part of the equation for that process of end of life, that's where those those victims were brought to. Wow. So there were always, um, yeah, you know, stories of of ghosts in the building and things like that. Really? But I can tell you, I I was there, I was there more than anyone overnight by myself. Mm-hmm. I spent yeah. so many hours rewiring the building. Uh, resolving issues because those were full service stations when I first started with they had automation but they were still um somebody was there 24 mm-hmm. 7 so I guess Sky might have been there at the times that I was there um well it, it got to a point you know because Sky was the overnight guy on Sunny okay um that would uh, hand off to Dave when Dave got there um but it, it got to a point where we convinced Dudley that was no longer needed because automation was solid. He Mm -hmm. could trust that he could trust automation. He didn't need somebody to babysit it. And so it got to a point where nobody was there and I would be working. I just can't imagine how many hours, uh, I spent doing things overnight and, you know, and Jennifer got so used to it. Yeah. I mean, not being home, you know, for those, because you couldn't do it during the day, uh, because they were full service, um, Right. Even you though they were automated, the yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't just go into the studio and because uh, we weren't voice tracking at that time. Right. So it was live a hundred percent of the time. If I needed to take something offline or upgrade or replace or do something, it had to be done after hours. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was so delicate of an environment during the day. Uh, the respect for the for for even entering the studios was extremely high, and. And Dudley uh, reinforced that too. I mean, mm-hmm. he didn't want to see people in the studios um, uh, bothering the on-air talent, especially Sonny. <laughs> yeah, especially Sonny. Oh, I feel Murray. like I remember hearing things like that, like "Don't go in there and bother the talent." We're like, "No, come in and talk to us." Yeah, yeah. So then We're I would fine. make a trip over to Longview, and it's completely a different environment. Yeah, I yeah mean, just yes. completely different environment. Yes. Um, and I remember running into you over there because mm-hmm. that's uh, it was after. I guess were you are were you working there before uh, Waller acquired those stations, Mandy? Yeah, I, w- I originally okay. was hired by Waller. Okay. Yeah. Oh, by Waller. Okay. okay. So not before Waller. Okay. No. Okay. I was Just hired right after. in August of two thousand one. Okay. All right. Yeah, so, I don't remember. I, I don't did. remember the acquisition date because yeah. they were that was already Waller Broadcasting when I got there. Okay. Yeah, August of uh, of oh one. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Yep. Yeah. I started running college football games, inserting okay. commercials in okay. the KFRO AM studio. Mm. And then started graduating to various other tasks right. around the building. Right. And then um, by February of 2002, that was when I did my first on-air shift on KYKX. Mm. It was Super Bowl Sunday. Wow. I probably wouldn't remember those dates if like major things hadn't happened. But right. I got hired in August of 2001. And I remember that because I was already hired before September 11th happened. Right, right. And that was my 18th birthday. So like big milestone, big sure. major tragedy. Sure, 
felt connected to what was going on, mm-hmm. not only because I was studying journalism, but because I was already hired by the radio station. So right. if I wanted to know something, I knew I had an avenue to go get information. Right, right. So I think I even went up there that day. It seems like I remember um, our friend Buddy Logan worked there at the time, too. Really? See, I don't remember that. He was going by Drew Monroe at the time. Okay, I do remember the name. Yeah, and he had a Saturday night Texas show. And he's, I think he's just a couple years older than me. He was at Kilgore College at the time I was still in high school. But I think he enlisted shortly after, Hmm. um, shortly after September 11th happened. Wow. Interesting. And then I ended up at Kilgore College and he came back to Kilgore College to Mm -hmm. see a teacher. And there I am in the, in the classroom. And then lo and behold, he, you know, does his tour of service, comes back and he ends up at East Texas radio group and I'm still there. Right. It was pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like we're like siblings in radio because we just kept bumping into each other over the years. That's funny. Yeah. And I'm still there. That's yeah. That's the crazy thing about how long. When did you start? Um, It would have been um, probably it it was the late 1900s. Um, (laughs) 97, I think. Okay. Yeah. 98. Yeah. Isn't it odd how we can say that yep. now that we're in the 2000s? It is um, weird. And far enough in that it doesn't feel as strange. Like you wouldn't have said that in 2003. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it was in the last half of the last decade mm-hmm. of the 1900s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I started part time. Um, it was actually very interesting. I don't know if, if Rick and Dudley already had this master plan. You know, for how everything came together, they mm-hmm. might have. I don't know. Yeah. I've never had that conversation with Rick to uh, to find out if if they already had plans to acquire more stations um, that early on. But um, but they didn't have uh, they didn't have an engineer, or they didn't have a, um, a responsible engineer. I, I mean, I, I'm not criticizing. I'm, I'm very careful to, to never yeah. criticize or judge. Isn't there a company, though, person. that does like, um, is it Broadcast Works? Yeah, Broadcast or was Works. It? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Broadcast Works. They didn't different. have they didn't have Broadcast Works. I think they actually had somebody on staff. OK. Um, but, you know, everybody's unique and not yeah. everybody does everything, um, does everything uh, up to what management may want them to do. Sure. And technical people are of all different breeds. Um, and mm-hmm. so you get some good ones, you get some bad ones. Um, some that aren't very personable. You're y- very yes. personable. Well, I try to be. You um, are. But, uh, and so uh, I think, I think Sands was the one that had the conversation with Rick. Mm-hmm. We didn't even know him at the time. Um, and they were looking for somebody, contract labor, to help with engineering Mm -hmm. um but then they also had a few computers and again this was this was yeah mid 19 you know uh, has it been 90 uh 96 97 maybe um and they had just a few computers Uh, you didn't see those in many businesses at that point Mm -hmm. um uh, small businesses at least you didn't see them and so uh i didn't go for that meeting but sands came back uh to the office because he and i were uh were working together at that time doing other uh, electronic repair and, um, and Sands had told him, yeah, yeah, we'll take care of it. And Rick had asked him, okay, can you handle the computers? And he said, yeah, Murray can take care of that. Of course, I didn't have hardly any experience in that at all. So he came (laughs) back and told me that that was my responsibility. And I literally, I mean, the phrase was really accurate in this case. I had to fake it until I make it. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, I had to go down to Jacksonville, walk in that building, and act like I knew what I was doing as it relates and to you supporting. Were pretty young. Oh, I was. Yeah, yeah. I was eighteen. Um, no, I would say I was twenty. Okay. One. I really don't know exactly. It, my years may be off just a little bit because it's mm-hmm. been so long. Um, you know, Jennifer and I met in uh, 90, uh, 98. Mm-hmm. Um and I'm pretty sure it was before we met, but it could have been you know, right afterwards. Um, so yeah, I was, I was in my early twenties, uh, which was so long ago when you think about it. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Cause you were really young. I was eight. I was 17 when okay. they hired me. Yeah. I turned yeah. 18 shortly after. Yeah. yeah. So I was in my early twenties. Yeah. And so I, I would walk in that building, which was very intimidating because that building mm-hmm. in Jacksonville, like we've talked oh, about, I'd have been ter- yeah, I'd been was, terrified. <laughs> was high class. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was everything was just in its place yeah. and everything was done, um, uh, you know, 
to a to a standard that that had to be uh, maintained and uh, and created when something new was brought in. You'd had to you know create it to that same standard and match it. So so I walked in and and thankfully uh, it didn't take long for me to realize that that I really um, uh, I had the knack for you know, for computers, uh, mm-hmm. and technology in general, which was good. Cause that would have been so <laughs> embarrassing. Can you imagine walking yes. in and me just trying to, I mean, in life, you really have to do that. Sometimes mm-hmm. you do in order to grow, you've yeah. got to be willing to step outside your comfort zone. Uh, I was kind of thrown into that, but, but I'm thankful that, that I was and, uh, and it worked out, it worked out. And so, uh, from there, you know, supporting, I mean, they had maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 computers in the whole building. They were already running automation that they had just gotten, Scott Studios, mm-hmm. um, a touchscreen. But it was DOS, DOS-based. I mean, Windows wasn't really that dominant. Wow, I didn't dominant. realize there was a DOS-based Scott Studios Yes, yeah, that's a 32 DOS, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they had just implemented that. And that might have been part of what uh, spurred Rick to look for somebody mm-hmm. locally who could help. I really don't know. I don't know what, what, how that looked ahead of me. Um, if I remember correctly though, I, I remember going down there and the engineer was asleep in one of the studios. So that kind of paints the picture, you know, back yeah. to what I was saying that, yeah. that not everybody works at the same level. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know, and he had not had a medical condition. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but Rick was really professional about things. And so mm-hmm. he, he wanted a standard as well. Um, so from there, uh, I don't I don't remember the exact order of the stations, but you know at that point, Sunny was in there, uh, uh, Kibi was in there. Those were pretty much the only two stations I, I think that they started with. Uh, then one hundred two three was built, which would have been KLJT. Mm-hmm. Um, was it a jazz station at one point? Um, it was. It was jazz. Yeah. It was it was contemporary Christian at mm-hmm. one point. Uh, the light. Okay. Um, and. And that station was uh, was built out south of Jacksonville. Um, so not in the same main hub where Sunny and Kibi were housed. Well, I mean, it, it was in the the um, the transmitter was built out south. Oh, okay. But, but okay. yeah, we operated it out of one of the production rooms. Mm-hmm. Uh, we converted, and it wasn't a closet. I mean, it was actually a full uh, a, a full size studio. And again, those studios were built where there had to be plenty of room for the reel to reel machines. See, they were mm-hmm. built old school where they had to have a lot of room. Um, but they had three production rooms, you know, wow. in that building to start with. Uh, yeah. But again, was, that equipment took up quite a bit of space too. Again, you've got reel to reel machines, yes. potentially yeah. cassettes, yep. mm-hmm. carts, yeah. carts, all of it. Absolutely. Yeah. A wall of carts. I mean, and a place to store all of the produced material right. because it wasn't right. digital. Yeah. And I'm thinking the automation system that Sonny had first would have been the, uh, the pioneer six disc, uh, changers, the wall really? of six disc changers. I forget what that was called. Um, huh. I don't know if that was a Digilink system. I think it was a Digilink system because KV and E, I think, had that same system. I've never if seen you remember, one like that. Do you remember the Pioneer six disc, uh, the six pack? Um, it was like the size, you know, the six pack, yeah, it would have been about the size they, of a book. Yeah. And you load it up with six disc and you insert it into the no, player. Chuck, I'm sure, remembers that. That was before my time. By the time I made it to automation right scott studios i think ss32 what mm-hmm. you're describing yeah, yeah. was in the kykx yes, studio yeah. but in the kfro studio it was something a little bit older right i yeah. had keyboard commands yeah. but i think it might have been scott studios no it was owned by scott studios i don't okay. remember the name of it but uh, i had to become intim- intimately familiar with all of those to press like the f auto- function yes. keys and all kinds yeah. of stuff it was to fire off the different mm-hmm. pieces of audio but it was just commercials that were running on right. that piece of it, and then automation feeds would come in through it. There was mm-hmm. a tone of some kind. Right. But when we were doing it live on KFRO, we were playing CDs, mm-hmm. just in a traditional CD player. Okay. okay. Or it was a, hybrid. A hybrid, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Chuck. Because what, you would, because what you would have is you would have, when you weren't live, because I was doing mornings there, mm-hmm. I guess maybe six months, it would be, um, um, what would happen is it would be Westwood One, mm-hmm. and then what, what hmm. we would do is, on what I'd have to do on a daily basis is look at their log on there because all these which was easier so you could take an hour before an hour after reconcile it with what we had so you wouldn't have you know blinded by the light played you know two hours in a row and stuff like that but i remember the um the you know the wall of cds you know for for kwi and, and i and 
and correct me if I'm wrong, Maria, and I think Dave mentioned it, wasn't the control module for that, like, you know, the pegs, the battleship system? You know what I mean? Um, that's a good question. That that would predate me. Um, that's not an image. The the controller for the uh, uh, for let's just say that it's Digilink, just for a conversation. I don't know mm -hmm. sure if it was. It was a small controller that just had uh, you know microchips in it. Um, but every disc had to it had to be programmed to know exactly what disc was in which tray. And this wasn't a carousel CD player. I mean, it was the six pack, so they were they were stacked vertically. Uh, but you could have had 50 players in there. Wow. Uh, yeah, so that had been 300, 300 CDs. And so you they would have, did, too. Yeah, you would have to tell the system exactly which disc was in which tray and which player. That sounds like a lot of room for track. error. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of room for, for, uh, for mechanical failure because yeah. every yeah. disc has to be extracted out of the six-pack and you know laid on the spindle to play, and it would have to do that automatically. Mm -hmm. Um so there were lots of failures, but it was it was impressive for its time in yeah. terms of automation for sure. But it had to, you, somebody had to babysit it. You would never leave it leave it yeah. by itself um, un, unattended because you're just asking for dead air. It's just a guarantee. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I remember the um, the automation systems in Longview on Kicks and KFRO. So what what format was on KFRO? Was that oldies? It was at that oldies time? at the time. Yeah, yeah. Because I I've, I have flipped so many formats. I bet you have in my years. It, sometimes over a weekend. I don't um, even know what's on that station right now. I think maybe Chuck told me last week that it's gone back to oldies, that uh, somebody acquired yeah. it and it's gone back to oldies. Yeah. Is that right, Chuck? Oh, UT? Uh, no, the KFRO. 90, yeah, 95.3? Well, 95.3 is a KVNE. Oh, is it? Okay, now, okay, yeah. But there's KFRO AM. Yes, um, that, that must be it. Yeah. yeah but, KRF, a, KRF, FRO, or blah, blah, blah. isn't that kind of like, a, isn't Scott running like a, syndication always on KFRO AM. I, I don't think. know if it's syndicated or if he's running it himself, but I believe it is an oldies format. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Back to what okay. it originally was or close to it. Yes. Yeah. At some point. Um, yeah. Um, but, uh, but I'm remembering every time you mention KFRO, I'm remembering Charlie. Uh, yeah. Thomason. Oh know. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Charlie yeah. was Sweet a prince. Man. He was, and he was always there. Mm -hmm. Every time I would go over there, yes. he was there. He was working. That was his life. That was his passion. Mm -hmm. That was his love. I mean, mm -hmm. he loved. He that never, station. you know, he he never raised his voice at anything. No, mm -mm. no. He was just a cool cat. Yeah, wonderful Absolutely. person. Yeah, I enjoyed working with him. I mean, for I mean, generationally, for mm -hmm. me being as young as I was, mm -hmm. he was very grandfatherly with me mm -hmm. and patient. Sure, he was so patient. I mean, I'm. I was pretty sharp and eager to learn. And at the same time, of course, I'm making mistakes, right? Sure. Because I'm starting to gain some confidence and then I mess stuff up. But he and Gary Mason both were just incredibly patient with me and let me play and explore and figure out kind of what I wanted to do within that space. And, you know, trusted me too. I mean, mm -hmm. I was telling Chuck, I don't know if it was last week when we recorded or not, but. There was a band that, oh, it was when we had Kenny Smith in the studio with us. There was a band that I loved that was out of Silicon Valley in the early 2000s. And they performed at a venue that live streamed music in like 2003. Well, to watch a live streamed show in 2003, you really needed to be on a high speed internet connection. Sure. And not everybody had that. Most people still had dial up in their mm -hmm. houses, mm -hmm. including my family. So because they trusted me. I had a key to the station. I'd be up at the station in the production room at hmm. eight o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, watching a live streamed concert by myself on the production room, you know, computer. I was smart enough not to do it at the studio where I could accidentally put it on the air. I was in the production room mm -hmm. where it was safe. But I mean, I got to do things like that that I would not have been able to do had I not developed trust with them. And, you right. know, it was neat. Had some neat I love empty radio them. stations, yes. you know? I bet you do the too. <laughs> Empty radio stations. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I can't think of any. Um, no, I mean like when you're the only person that's there. Oh, that kind of empty. That I thought kind you of meant empty. Like, um, uh, like uh, vacant? radio. Yeah, vacant. Yeah, no. yeah. Ones that you've gone into that used to exist. No, uh, I've never done that. That yeah. would be strange. Yeah. Which? Well, I guess I did in Jacksonville, but um, but yeah, that that yeah, that can be strange. Yeah, I guess so. There's. Um, 
uh, for a technical person, yes, of course, an empty station mm-hmm. is the ideal station. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of station you want yeah. as a technical person because you can, if you know what you're doing, you can you can dismantle the entire thing mm-hmm. and keep it on the air, mm-hmm. and then put it all back together before the next shift, before the next person walks in. So that's that's the ideal setup. And you know, with current technology, that's what you encounter almost all the time is an empty studio. Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. Uh, or it's 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 much easier to find an empty studio or if not, it's easy to create one because mm-hmm. um, the person can say, OK, let me just track these next four breaks and I can get out of your way. That's true. Yeah. So they'll Done just that go plenty of and, times. Yep. They'll mm-hmm. just track the next you know, however many hours you need. They'll get out of the studio and then you can do what you need to do. Yeah. Uh, so it's so much more convenient now mm-hmm. uh, compared to in the past. And also with Internet connectivity, being able to remotely access and, and manage and support stations is a game. Uh, that was a game changer. When did that happen um, for you initially? You know what? That was I don't know what year, but there was an application that Symantec came out with. They were the, uh, the creators of Norton Antivirus mm-hmm. uh, and they created PC Anywhere. This would have been in the late '90s, early 2000s, over over dial-up or what you would have been encountering uh, uh, in the early 2000s at the station would have been an ISDN connection, most likely, mm-hmm. which which was a big step up from dial-up. But nowadays, that was ain't. Still I mean, slow. oh yeah, that was ridiculously <laughs> slow. For one person, it would have been fine. For an entire mm-hmm. office, it was it was a challenge to uh, to allocate bandwidth, but. Um, but yeah, PC Anywhere allowed you to connect remotely from one computer to another computer, direct connection. No, there was no cl- no such thing as cloud back then, so there were no servers in the cloud that you were going through, and it was just so impressive to be able to sit at home or anywhere where I was that had the PC Anywhere application, and then remote into a computer that's just you know even five miles away. Yeah, it's just unheard of. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that's really where where uh, things changed, but not drastically, because it, not only was it extremely expensive of an application, um, it was only supported on relatively few operating systems. So I had to drive to Jacksonville every time there was an outage. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, that was, you know, maybe a 30 minute drive one way. You know, when Steve Bridges was, you know, was engineering, mm-hmm. you know, for our group. He drove to Jacksonville from Longview so oh many my. times, and I felt so bad every time that, that he had to make that drive for something that, yeah. that I couldn't handle. Because even at that point, my love, uh, level of experience and expertise on the engineering side of things was still very limited. Um, so there weren't things that I could handle for him. He just needed to come over and do it himself. It's different now, of course. You know, so much of it is IP-based in the studios and the transmitter sites that – uh, that Sands is, you know, is is handing more and more things to me now because mm-hmm. it's just, uh, it's just, it's totally changed. It's totally changed uh, from what it used to be. Uh, everything's a computer now. I was about to say much everything. more digital. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's I, everything's IP based, and so uh, everything has an IP address, and you're remoting in to pretty much every device. That sits on the network or that sits in the air chain, which everything that sits in the air chain is sitting on the network uh, now. It didn't used to be that way. But when when Log Me In came about for remote access and it was free, I don't know what year that was, but that was the game changer for sure, because you can install that on any computer and it was free up to however many devices. And I had it on every device that I could put my hands on. Mm-hmm. Because if it could save me from having to drive even, you know, five miles, mm-hmm. then why not? Because you could jump on that issue uh, very quickly and mm-hmm. resolve it and save your time. And so I just can't imagine the number of hours that I was able to stay at home with Jennifer because of Log Me In. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I did Because you're, you're talking about primarily after hours even. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And then once the kids came about too, mm-hmm. you know, being able to stay at home and they've gotten so used to me just slipping away into the office real quick. I've mm-hmm. got to go take care of a problem. Mm-hmm. Just slip into my office, log in, knock out whatever the issue is anywhere and, and anywhere in the world. You could do that. Yeah. And I'm doing it in lots of locations, not just here, but I support offices in other states. And so I'm logging in, taking care of a problem and then just resuming whatever it was I was I was doing with the family. Um and 
you know, 20, 25 years ago, that wasn't possible. I'd have to get in a right. car, drive, and it could be as simple as just having to turn off a computer and turn on a computer. You got to put in the time and drive. I'm laughing because I can't remember. Uh, Chuck sent me some notes. He's really great at always providing notes ahead of interviews. And the first thing it says on the top of Murray Camper notes is, did you reboot the computer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You'd be surprised still, even to this day. Yeah. That's what Um, I do with my phone. Anytime it starts to really act up, I'm like, oh, it's probably been a while since I've turned it off. Yeah. And and let me tell you why that's still a challenge for end users. Um, Computers have become... No matter how how negative some users might be towards Windows 10 or Windows 11, um, and I'm not talking Linux or any of the other you know distros out there. It's the dominant in, or Mac OS. The dominant is Windows. It still yeah. is. Microsoft still is has the dominant um, operating system in the world. And you'd be surprised at how uh, stable and reliable Windows 10, Windows 11 is. So I'll encounter computers that haven't re- been rebooted for almost a year. Wow. So, you know, it's not the end user's fault that they don't think of it anymore because right. their computer has just been so stable. good and stable for them mm-hmm. that it's not something that they normally even do. Um, so it, 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 it back you know, 10, 15 years ago, that was something you always did. Yeah. We like did every day. Yeah, yeah. Every day you would just, <laughs> I don't, turn I, it off it would and just turn reboot. It on. And it would take five minutes for that process to take mm-hmm. place because it was so slow. Yes. You, know, you could get up and go to the bathroom. Okay. I'm about to restart. Got to get up. And I remember, um, <laughs> it, there, there, there are certain things in, in my field that, um, uh, that, that you kind of keep track of, uh, just mentally. And one thing I was always keeping track of, uh, not, not precisely, but just in a general sense is that I spent, I spent more of my time waiting for computers than oh, I did actually yeah. fixing them. Cause I, cause if there's anybody that has to reboot a computer, it's me. I'm the one that's rebooting all right. the time. Right. Um, when I'm working on a problem, that's one of the first things that I would do is restart the computer just to make sure that that didn't clear the issue. And so if you think about how many times I've had to restart a computer over almost 30 years of, uh, of working in that, that field, uh, that's just, it's just, I have no idea how much time that would be. Yeah. Just tons of waiting. And then, then I started to think, what did I do with all that time? I because, was just about to ask you that question. <laughs> because we didn't have smartphones right. for a large part of that time. So up you until, were distracting yourself with TikTok. Yeah, yeah. Up until, and yeah. I, I still Not that you I would do that now. Do but... Believe it or not, I still don't do TikTok. But um, up to 07. So 07 is mm-hmm. when the iPhone came out, if I remember correctly. Uh, and of course I didn't, I, I didn't get one of those and we can talk about it here in just a minute. Uh, cause I'm slow to adopt on some things. Um, but prior to that time, I guess I was just, just sitting there, just twiddling my thumbs mm-hmm. and literally as, as you know, <laughs> I guess so. Uh, isn't that amazing that, that we would be spending that time thinking mm-hmm. and pondering our life's choices, but, um, or what you want to have to eat. <laughs> yeah, because a reboot back then could take that could take two or three minutes yeah, it could. for each one. Mm-hmm. And a lot of uh, resolving issues is trial and error. Mm-hmm. And so you would restart, come up, make a change and then restart again yeah. and then come up and make a change, restart again. And so that's just hours and hours and hours of of just looking at what people had in their offices on the walls you know, maybe listening to music because there might have been some playing at the station. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, listening to Sunny because that was pretty much on every mm-hmm. phone and every overhead system in Tyler Longview during yeah. that during that era. Um, yeah, so it's it's completely different now. You know, restarts are much faster, less than sixty seconds. And again, most users aren't doing it because it's something that they forget about. But Chuck is right. That's that is the number one solution um, to a problem is to still reboot the device. And it's interesting that now we say device, we used to say computer, and everything is really a computer uh, uh, at its core, but so many things are computerized now that require reboots that it really is just called a device. It could even be your coffee maker. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if, if it's computerized, if it has a microprocessor in it, then it's gonna, it's gonna need to be rebooted at some point because something's gonna malfunction. It's almost a guarantee. Yeah, it's really interesting. But back to the adoption of the iPhone in 07. I'm remembering, believe it or not, Sands uh, is more on top of getting newer phones than I am. And he was one of the first ones that got an iPhone in 07. Mm-hmm. He was one of the first ones that got the StarTac or StarTac 
the micro, the Motorola, the little flip phone that oh. only doctors and lawyers were buying uh-huh. back then. Uh-huh. It's a real thin. Um, I remember when it came out and, and he bought that uh, and brought it to the office. It's an amazing piece of technology. So tiny. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy how we've gone the opposite direction with phones. Yes. You know, it was striving to get the smallest phone for so long. And then all of a sudden now we're going back to developing these huge phones that are like books almost. You're holding a book up to your ear. That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, we don't have to hold you it up to what? our ear anymore. You know what? I have yeah, I have, to, I have yeah. to I have to butt in and say this. And, and, and this is just from my point of view. Uh-huh. When, when I'm with my better half and she says, you know what? I'm going to go shopping. Do you want to watch Netflix in the car <laughs> or go with me? And I'll say, well, you know what? Let me just sit here and uh, protect the car so nobody hijacks it. And I'm going to watch Netflix. I'll be a good husband and do that. I like, I, you know, I've got the, 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 I think I've got iPhone 12. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing what all we can do now. And from that same iPhone, log me in has an app and so i i now don't get up uh, in the middle of the night if i get a silence alert or i get a text about some system being offline or or having issues uh i don't even get up and go to the office i just do it right from bed i'm literally laying there wow looking at my phone logging in restarting the computer troubleshooting reloading the log whether it's music or traffic and resolving the issue right then and there um so i don't even have to get up isn't that just crazy to think that? Yeah, it is. I've, I've seen Dave Moreland do that. We, we've, we've had coffee break on a Saturday occasionally, mm-hmm. and something's happened on the blaze. He's had to go in and, do, and go, oh, I have to see if these if this syncs up correctly mm-hmm. like at 10 o'clock, and if it doesn't, I have to go. I got to go. Right. And so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he's doing that from Log Me In. That's an account. Yes. You know, I share out access on my account to everybody at the stations that, mm-hmm. that I support. And so Dave has uh, has a user on my log me in account and 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 he's he has learned that skill of how it really is a skill of how mm-hmm. to use log me in, especially from your phone uh, over time. But it just it, it, well, really it allows becomes easy. you to delegate. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And empowers them to solve yes. problems for themselves, which is also beneficial yeah, to yeah. the whole environment. Yes, because I'm not wanting to have to log in if somebody right. else can do it. Uh, and he's uh, and he's a first responder for, you know, for those stations Mm -hmm. and does an amazing job, especially from the generation that he's from. Mm -hmm. Um, He has, uh, you know, he has been able to learn that technology, automation, uh, remote access, so much technical stuff Dave has learned, um, you know, uh, since, uh, since starting at, you know, at the blaze um, over at Reynolds, he's really good at it. He's really good at it. His attention to detail. So we've all known that mm-hmm. Dave's attention to detail is so impressive, so impressive. He's one of those people as well that if he says he's going to, you know, be there at eight twelve in the morning, he's going to pull up at eight twelve in the morning. Mm-hmm. You don't have to call and check to see if he's going to be there or not. He's going to be there. Yeah, if not something Clockwork. seriously wrong. Yeah, yeah, you better yeah. call. Yeah, you better call and do a, a, a you know welfare check at yeah. that point. <laughs> yeah, if he's not, if he hasn't shown up at eight twelve, because uh, he is spot on. Uh, with everything that he does very impressive very impressive but yeah yeah he he does really good with keeping those stations uh, on track even you know having semi you know semi retired but um but overall the whole field i mean it's just all the changes over so many uh so many decades that i've been involved i mean obviously it goes way back but there was a time if you think about it, there was pre-technology of course you could always say there's been a shift of technology over decades since radio was invented. But Mm -hmm. there was that huge shift though in the nineties. Yep. Yeah. I mean, they did, we did go from real, real, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to carts and, um, to, um, to CD decks, the Denon CD deck, Mm -hmm. um, uh, then into automation. But that right there, when we changed automation, computerized automation, that was that was the big shift for the industry. And I remember ninety five. Uh, yeah, it was right in the mid nineties. Yeah, I, I remember sooner. seeing the article from about RCS, and they said the phrase "paperless control room," and I mm-hmm. went, "Uh oh." Yeah, yeah, and that's something. And Mandy and I really weren't there for that. You know, no. uh, I wasn't even. I was just getting right out of high school at that point. Uh, just prior to that and I had no interest in radio hadn't really even been in a studio but um 
but yeah, it was a big change. And then I remember when voice tracking came out, mm-hmm. um, nobody was really doing it that, that I'm aware of, at least in, in these markets, um, these small KVNE markets. was first, I believe. Um, you know, weren't I don't think they Murray. Uh, I think hmm. he had the first digital system. I, I think I can say that. Well, right? uh, that's a good question. They had Digilink as well. So Sonny was uh, Sonny and KVE were tracking very close together. Not voice tracking, but tracking in terms of what technology they were using. Yeah. Um, because they both. Had I just the thought same that they were way ahead of everybody in the market. Uh, you, know, you know, they've gotten there. That's for sure. I mean, that <laughs> because yeah, yeah, that, because in the mid in the mid nineties, when I was a uh, uh, king in UE. We were doing our commercials and jingles digitally, but the music was still CD. So, you know, because mm-hmm. that's all we had room for. Right. As far as, um, what am I saying? Disc space, you know. Right. But that was a different time. I, I To this day, I still remember they were talking about, oh, no, one gig? One gig is $1,000. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, 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 it was, and it was always uh, when, when we would do music logs, uh, we would back them up. Uh, daily and also two discs and there would be a set of discs at the station and I would have another set of discs backup discs um, for uh, music master in my briefcase because if things blow up well at least you have that and you just you know yes. get things going but yeah and that, and that only happened once you know the blue screen of death happened it was like in 93 <laughs> or something that was the and name I, and, I, and, I, and I and I and I called and I and I remember calling uh selector and i said uh i'm looking at a blue screen that has a white spider web on it is this bad <laughs> yes it is yes it is <laughs> your yeah. system has crashed you have backups yes so yeah that worked out pretty well but i always love selector even you were talking about dos selector dos i always thought was the best i mean yeah. for yeah. a long time even when everybody converted to windows uh type systems and music master was good too yeah, and Selector DOS is still in use and really? uh, in some markets. Sure, really? Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's been ported over to Windows, but it's still the DOS framework um, that that it was originally, you know, uh, coded for. And it works really well. And um, there's probably still some Music Master DOS users out there. Those were all, I, I don't, I can't speak for Selector, but so many of those applications were um, perpetual license. And so once you purchased it, you owned it. Mm-hmm. Uh, or you were licensed to use it perpetually. And so if you could install it on a system and the system never changed, you could to this day still be using it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing to prevent Without you. Without an additional that. investment. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, Which not is a so different. Everything's yeah. subscription-based yeah. now. Yeah, the word subscription just it took on a completely different meaning probably what Software 10 licensing. or 15 years ago. Yeah. Yes. Subscription was more of magazines, uh-huh. you know, and uh-huh. gym memberships. Yes. Um, we, we had a, we had a huge conversion uh, about a, what would it be two years ago in January where our, our news boss uh, software, it was 1997 version and we wow. had to convert because of windows seven and man, it was one of those things to where they said, okay, everybody, you know, back up everything that you need to be backed up, you know, any scripts, any of this. And then it was, okay, we've got to uh, make sure that uh, all the commercials are backed up and everything's set. And then uh, when we were saying, well, are you sure this is going to be absolutely 100%? We don't know. <laughs> right. And when it actually converted, it did fine. But there was a good three, four months, boy, every morning, the morning crew would have something, you know, the, the system would shut down three minutes before airtime. Oh, goodness. Oh, gosh. And, and Jeff was Jeff uh, Rourke, our ops guy and morning person and prod guy would say, you know, if it was something consistent, but every day it was different. Hmm. And I would kid them. I'd say, you know, I, I, he and Melissa would be talking and Melissa Kaiser would be talking about a problem. I would say, here, let me make notes to protect the afternoon guys. <laughs> so because because, man, it's just, you know, from a jock's point of view, if I'm hearing large amounts of static or silence, I'm going, oh, well, that's not good. You know, <laughs> no. I mean, what do you have, Murray? I mean, as an engineer, what do you have? Um, or, or maybe from an engineer's point of view, do you look at everything as just a problem, a math, like a mathematical equation that you just have to break it down and solve? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You really do. You've got to, um, you've got to pigeonhole that problem. You can't get overwhelmed by the big picture 
Um, and, and that's what end users normally do is they get overwhelmed, uh, not just by oh, yeah. the problem, but it looks overwhelming and, and things can even look overwhelming to me at times, uh, especially new, new technology. It's, um, the, it's human nature to, um, uh, you know, to see smoke and think the entire house is on fire, mm-hmm. you know, when really it's just, you know, something's burning in the kitchen, you know, that was left in the oven or something. It's really easy with technology to see that smoke and think the entire system is, is broken. Uh, and, and I have to, I have to manage that with, within users. Some of them are much more dramatic and emotional than others. <laughs> That's an acquired skill, uh, in and of itself working with end users. But, um, uh, but yeah, it, the technical mind, and I think I can speak for, you know, all technical people. So that the technical mind is able to uh, block out so much and zero in on the precise issue, and and just be very uh, methodical and and analyzing uh, top to bottom very rapidly mm-hmm. in order to zero in really what the problem is, and and a lot. Ties back to what you were just talking about with news bosses. You look for patterns. You look for a common denominator, mm-hmm. um, especially if it's a repetitive thing. There's a lots. There there are lots of anomalies uh, uh, with issues where they're just one off problems that you're not going to encounter again, or if you do encounter again, it's just a different flavor of that issue. Um, but again, they, both of those flavors have a common denominator. And so, yeah, it is, it is like a math, it is like a math problem. Really? It is. And, but, a, and of course with news boss, it was something, I think probably after we got about three, four months after under our belt and everybody, and there was like making sure that, you know, everybody was on the same page on certain issues that, oh, by the way, file names can't be 25 figures. You know, you have mm-hmm. to do this. You can't have this in there. Just, you know. You know, right. getting all of the talent on the same page, you know, things really worked well. And it's really, really, really a good system. I like it a lot. I really do. Yeah. And I think you all fell victim to a big gap in uh, versions. Mm-hmm. So you went from a very old version to probably the latest version. And yeah. And the, and because the you didn't step about- through it, you ended up, yeah, you ended up having more problems because the gap was so big. There was a big bridge it- there. Exactly. And the nice thing about it for us, because, you know, the, the interface that we, we were dealing with, we were able to still keep that uh, going forward. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the back end is operating differently, but the front that we were looking at was the same. So it, it gave all of us really a good comfort level as far as dealing with things. It worked great. Right. right. You just had to get to a point where you trusted the system and had confidence that it was going to work for you. Yeah. So they gave you the legacy, the legacy uh, user interface, which was always nice. Yeah. Um, and I like the fact, too, that there, I mean, it's really still pretty flexible as far as with News Boss, where you can sit there and process all of your sound in Boss. I have a, a thing where I do, where whether it's uh, network stuff or maybe recording something off of a, a feed. I usually process every all of my stuff off Audacity, send it into the boss so I can do some final um, uh, production and then load it into the system. But, but, yeah, it's for me, it works great. And everybody, you know, we have a I think that it gives us a pretty good type product on the year. I really do. Yeah. Your whole setup over there at Glaser is pretty impressive. Um, oh, oh, yeah. You know, I uh, just it, recently started. um uh, supporting, you know, certain aspects of that, of that operation, you know, as Chuck, as Chuck can attest to, cause he, he's, he has seen me pop in the studio, mm-hmm. uh-huh. um, you know, just a few times, but, um, but yeah, just recently, I mean, it's, I'd never been over there in, in, it's you know, nice in almost 30 studio. years. Yeah. Yeah. We had some folks touring there. Well, they actually, they were in about three weeks ago because the Texas Rangers World Series trophy was in. Yes. And it was, this was so fantastic because uh, Paul Gleiser had it up on display, catered some food from Jimmy Oh, it came Johnson. to the studios? Chuck, you didn't call me and uh, invite me over? I'm offended. A, a lot of offended or just a little? Uh, I'm, I'm getting more and more offended the longer I think about it. <laughs> well, okay. Well, well, yeah. uh, well, well, if, if the Stars win the Stanley <laughs> Cup and they bring it over. Yeah, you better call me. Or the next time. Okay. The next time the Rangers win the World Series and they do the okay. same thing, you'll okay? call. Me. Okay. 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 So, 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 but what happened was 
It was That's so awesome. interesting because the dads, there was a couple of dads with their eight year old kids and, yeah. and the dads were probably more thrilled than the kids seeing the place. But I was talking to one of the dads and I said, uh, you're looking at a unicorn here. Mm-hmm. I said, this isn't, this isn't like all radio stations. He goes, Oh, I know that I've seen a couple. I said, you know, we have, we have a staff of, I think with 17. I said, most, I said, you couldn't, if you put the staff of everybody in the marketplace, it wouldn't count for 17. And I said, <laughs> you have a working yeah. radio station here that are passionate about the job. You have the owner who's just passionate about putting a good quality product. And, you know, you mm-hmm. just, yeah, or as I tell, as I tell people on a Monday through Friday basis from 6A to 6P, Name me stations in the market that will give you up-to-date current information and current weather between those hours. And the only answer I have is KTBB. I know I'm sounding like a little bit of a shrill here, but still. You're proud of the work that you do, and there's a lot to be said for that. But, Murray, it's like you were saying about, you know, you you grow into the job. Me, I I made it there after 99.3, went to Hispanic Top 40. I lucked out. I, I had a week of downtime, sent Paul Barry some information, my tape and or tape, my MP3 <laughs> audition and resume. And and then they called me and they said, come on in an interview. And so um, within a month, I, we, I kind of did this part time, full time thing. We, you know, we sniffed around and tried each other out for about a month. And Paul said, let's do this. So that was really interesting getting in there as production director i'd never been one before so that was kind of another notch on the belt and then i think about a year into it mr gleiser said um you ever done news before well no and he goes well if you jock you can do news and i said oh okay (laughs) and so and so that was something to where all i did besides ask questions of john sims and melissa kaiser i just watched them and what they did a lot Mm-hmm. And, and and Paul's golden rule on stories is, do we care? Why should we care about this? So even now, when I put, build the drive at five for, you know, Jared Jones and Roger Gray, it's every story. Why do we care about this? You know, what do we, you know, how's it going to figure in the entire package? And, you know, whether it's national stuff, regional stuff, or, you know, the, uh, the, the app of the day, which is our favorite. So, yeah, it's, and you're right. And you're right, Murray. I mean, you have a, an exceptional facility, KTBB and the team sports radio. And, you know, it's built for one, it's built because of one person's love of radio. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, if, if Paul Gleiser did not love radio, like he did, you wouldn't see that facility. Don't you think? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And I mean, he and Dudley were similar in that, you know, in that regard. I was having thing. the same line of thinking that, yeah. that you are, that Paul reminds me of the stories in, in that passion mm-hmm. and in that um, aspiration of excellence, yes, I feel like he and Dudley are in, of the same mold. Right. Yeah. yeah. Maybe different Maybe different temperaments or different oh, personality yeah. Yeah, quirks, yeah. which is fun. And that's part of the fun of radio is there's so many different personality quirks. You're True. mostly working with technology. But right. the other thing, the other through line is characters. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. the end user characters Mm -hmm. that you have encountered over the years. I don't want you to call anybody out or or say anything negative about anyone, but I would just blanket statement. You've probably met a lot of interesting folks. Yeah. And again, I I try to be very careful and not, uh, I'm not one to talk, uh, you know, negatively about anybody except, except to my wife uh, (laughs) when I get home at the end of the day Sure, and and rightfully so. I mean, right. I mean, that's that's something that that, you never know who you're going to work with tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. And you, and you need to be able to, you know, uh, vent to, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, um, uh, to your spouse, uh, you know, about certain things. Um, That's healthy. So, um, as long as I'm not dumping on her, you know, when I get home and I don't, and again, I'm very careful about, uh, uh, about images that I create in my mind about people. I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. I mean, I don't know what people are going through in their own lives and and they have to bring that to work with them and Mm -hmm. then they have to take it home. I mean, things may be totally falling apart for them in their personal life. And then they're, they're required to come to work. You know, because they have to, they have to, you know, make a, make a paycheck, take it home. Um, and some of them have to perform as if 
They're the happiest yes, person on the that's planet, exactly right. yeah, regardless yeah, of yeah. what's going on. And then, and then yeah. whenever I come into the picture, it's not normally <laughs> a happy time. A happy time, <laughs> no. uh, because when I'm showing up, it's usually because there's an issue mm-hmm. um, or there's a change. It, it's not always issues. I'm not always fixing issues. You know, I'm implementing change. I'm mm-hmm. I'm I'm, I'm uh, implementing progress, movement forward, new technologies that a lot of times the end users will see as problematic, uh, but it's necessary. It's necessary to do that. Um, and I always try to look at uh, what you know. What is the end user going to get out of this change? What's the mm-hmm. positive take on this? Uh, I never want to implement something that you know just is is all around negative, or that is uh, going to take us backwards. I'm not interested in doing that. And the good thing is, is that I feel like I have a lot of uh, autonomy and being able to make those decisions because of how long I've been doing this. Um, I'm not really forced to implement things or install things that that I wasn't involved in the in the decision uh, of, uh, That's nice. you know, of of um, coming to the, the conclusion, whether or not it's something that would be helpful Um and so, yeah, I've encountered lots of lots of various people, both in the uh, the front office and the back office. Mm-hmm. Um, usually, uh, well, I would say it's probably been 50-50, I would say, in terms of the challenges of dealing with, um, uh, you know, on air uh, with on air people. You would uh, you would sometimes have uh, uh, an ego to deal with mm-hmm. uh, as well. Not as much, though, in the size of a market as I can imagine it would be in a much larger market. Yeah. Um, but you have people that have have started in, uh, you know, a smaller market and grown up like Cornbread, you mm-hmm. know, for instance. And uh, I got along great with him. Um, uh, you know, people like that, just really good hearted, you know, a person, good personality. Um and then on the office side of things, yeah, there have been some, you know, some very difficult and challenging people, but that's just part of life and learning how to have those interactions mm-hmm. and balance and manage those interactions. And it's really an acquired skill for everybody. Yeah. One of my favorite things that you taught me working with you was like boundaries with requests. Mm. And pretty early on in our working relationship we've always got along well we've always mm-hmm. had good rapport but pretty early on you would stop me if i would come to your office and ask you for something and you would ask me to send you an email and that's how you told me you manage your tasks and it was such a good learning point for me not only to have respect for your task flow but also to teach me to do that for myself as well right and it's something that i implemented and that i worked through and it it helped me manage my workload probably too well because then i ended up with almost too much on my plate because I had yeah. trouble saying no, <laughs> but it was a really helpful, really helpful insight for me. Right. Yeah. Cause it, cause imagine being one person and mm-hmm. there's 50 end users. And right. if, if even a 10th of those end users are coming to your office about something, uh, your day is totally held hostage by those five people, mm-hmm. um, you know, that are showing up with their, their request. And to them, it's important. What they need is important. And, and I'm not, you know, uh, uh, disagreeing with that. I mean, that it's important to them. So it's important to me. It's just in the bigger picture of things. Where does it fall priority wise? Sure. You know, in, in, in the bigger picture. Um, so, and some users, again, there are some users that can't see that, that just cannot grasp that concept of how could anything be more important than the problem that I'm having right now? Yes. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, sometimes I may just have to address those issues in real time mm-hmm. in order to just uh, because it's not worth um, to having that discussion with them. But, yeah, it, it, for the most part. Um, well, let me say this. It got to a point back. Uh, I don't I don't remember what year it is that I, I changed my cell phone number. It got, did? Yeah, it got to a point where I was just getting way too many calls from people about things that. um you know, I had a, I had the same number forever and Jennifer hated when I changed it because she, you know, had my number memorized. Of mm-hmm. course, this was back before, um, uh, before, uh, smartphones. You, you don't know anyone's number anymore. You just pull up their name on your phone. Right. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I got to a point where my phone was just ringing too often. Too many people had my, had my number both in businesses that I supported and, and in businesses that I either used to support. Uh, or in businesses where a user that I supported ended up relocating, you know, change jobs and, and, uh, 
and took me with them. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, Rod Wayne's a perfect example of that. Um, and I don't, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but you know, he would go somewhere and then I would get a call from him or from somebody in his office because they would have a problem that they weren't able to solve. And I was somebody that came to mind. And so he would call. Well, he trusts you too. Such a compliment, even though it's yeah. not necessarily helpful for you at the time. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's good. And I hope that that's true. Yeah. Uh, I hope that I'm just not the last, last ditch effort, you know, for, for people, but, mm-hmm. but yeah, somebody that, that I've built rapport with and, uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and trust. And when they run into a, a technical issue and again, this, whoever listens to this, this isn't an advertisement for no. call me if you run into a problem. <laughs> Uh, cause I don't want to change my number again, but, uh, luckily a lot of people don't know my, my number, which is good. Um, and that's best if they need to reach me. Yeah. Send me an email. If you don't know my email, then you probably shouldn't be trying to reach me. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, but yes, training users. That's what I've always called it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had to spend a lot of time training users to, um, uh, to, to fit into the processes that, that were best for me and for the companies Mm -hmm. uh, that I support. And, and it's worked really well. And for the most part, you know, I I have very few users that, that go outside the bounds, um, you know, of that, of those chains of communication. Yeah, for for sure. And, and, and thinking of uh, back thinking of Dudley, because there's so many fond memories uh, of, you know, of, of my times, you know, with him in his office meeting with, with him on things. And, uh, there were issues that, that I had, that was early on in my career. And, um, he was notorious for changing his mind on things. Mm -hmm. Uh, even though you would, he would be very certain in his initial decision. And if you didn't know him, you would, you would step away from the meeting going, okay, this is what we're doing. You know, he was very certain about this. And so there were times where he would want a change made um, that might take me um, all day to make a change. And this, this was change on templates, clocks. Uh, you know, it's interesting how uh, I branch over to every, every different uh, aspect, you know, of, of the operation, not just computers, not just engineering side of things, but also automation, also traffic music. Mm -hmm. I have to be able to integrate all that stuff together. And so, uh, there were times over many years where I was in charge of changing automation templates that, um, that merged together traffic and music. And, uh, I would take on that responsibility because everything that i support i have to look at through the lens of if something goes wrong who's the one that they're going to call mm-hmm. and who's the one that's going to have to fix it? it's going to be me and so i learned years ago that if i could plant myself into the traffic department learn that system learned what the templates and clocks what they need how they needed to be set up and structured so that the end result is what we wanted in the studio if I could inject myself into that process and actually even take over responsibility for some of it, then I could prevent a lot of issues that I would be the one that would have to resolve at the end. Mm -hmm. And I've done that with lots of, lots of the uh, workflows and processes in radio where I've, I've just injected myself into the music side of things. And Dave is very, very aware of that because he and I work closely on a lot of things. Um, and he knows how I like to inject myself in the front end of things because I want to make sure that the end result is what is needed. Otherwise, if you leave it to the hands of somebody that doesn't have the experience or the knowledge, they're going to do the best they can and put together uh, the the product that they think is going to work. And it might work, but then it might not. And then some days it might be a disaster. Mm-hmm. Other days it might be subpar. And I'm the one that has to clean up the mess at the end. And so, and a lot of times I'm that's... Remembering some, excuse me, I'm remembering some instances of subpar situations where maybe you weren't consulted. Yeah. Not yeah. not picking on any individuals, but I'm just thinking of when things were tried. Right. And then, oh, we should probably talk to Murray. Yes. Yeah. Because, because <laughs> yeah. whenever it's a mess after the fact... Mm-hmm. It's, it's harder. It's after five o'clock. Yes. It's on a Friday. You know what I'm saying? I it's, do. It's, I, I do. lose control over the timing of the result is what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, it's better for me to get ahead of it and, 
uh, you know, and get involved right from the beginning. So back to the story with Dudley is that he would, he would say, okay, here's the decision of what we're doing. Then I would go away and make that change. And then he would come walking into my office. I could hear him coming down the hall cause he'd clear his throat. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he, and I just, I knew it, my office was at the very end of the hallway. So anytime I could hear him coming, I knew what his, de- what his destination was. It mm-hmm. was my office. And he would come in there and say, well, you know, Murray, I was just thinking about what we talked about earlier. And he would just completely unwind everything that, had been decided. And after I had already invested hours making those changes. Um, so again, an acquired skill over time as humans, we all should be looking to improve and acquire skills and working with other people. And so I had to figure out how best to manage that process again ahead of time. So I went to him and said, Dudley, can you do me a favor? He was always big on absolutely. What can I do to help you? You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? He was mm-hmm. always big about that. Um, if you asked him, he was always open. I mean, he wouldn't, he wouldn't come proactively and just say, Hey, is there anything I can do for you? But anytime you would ask him, he was always happy to help. Um, and I said, look, when I need your help with something, absolutely. Murray, what, what is it that I can do when you make a decision? I need you to be sure that that's your decision because, uh, when you tell me that this is what you want to do, I'm on board and I immediately get started and I invest a lot of my time into making whatever the changes are that you, that you, you know, are deciding to make. And so if you come after the fact and decide you changed your mind, I've already invested, you know, however many hours into that. And he just really didn't even think about that, honestly. And so he was like, absolutely. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that for you. Mm -hmm. I'll help you with that. Mm -hmm. And so just learning how to have that interaction with him where it wasn't, um, uh, a lot of tension involved, <laughs> uh, yeah. but getting him to respect my time, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, and trying to implement a change that, you know, that he was certain that he wanted. Um, yeah. but, um, and there were many instances where, you know, where, uh, we would, uh, I say, we, sometimes it was me, sometimes it was Sands, sometimes it was Dave. We'd go in Rick's office, uh, because we would have to say, you know, Dudley, Dudley X, Y, Z, and Rick would say, I'll go talk to him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, and then Rick would, if it wasn't for Rick, I tell you what, I mean, just the whole operation, I, you're going to hear this from so many people. I'm certain of it that you would hear from so many people that if it wasn't for Rick, that entire operation, um, nothing against Dudley. It's just, there were so many important people needed in the puzzle, in the equation. And Rick filled a, a piece of that equation that was required for there to be success um, and I'm sure Dave would attest to that too. Cause mm-hmm. you know, Dave, I'm sure I had many conversations with Rick, uh, all the acquisitions, uh, you know, just maintaining the consistency of quality and so much stuff, uh, and not making lots of changes and flip flopping and the financial side of things, uh, all the, all the important decisions that had to be made, you know, uh, if Rick wasn't, hadn't been involved in all of that, I don't think I would be where I am. Because ultimately, he was the one that decided to bring me on board. Mm -hmm. He was very professional. Um, I didn't have a lot of day-to-day interactions with Rick, but he gave me some opportunities, too. You probably remember working on um, upgrading our websites. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. For all of the stations. And I happened to be probably the youngest person in the building. Right. So my interaction with websites, I had taken a couple of classes in high school and college. But I knew kind of how to speak a little bit of the technical language Mm -hmm. enough to, and also spoke the language of the, you know, radio side of it, that I was able to have a conversation and sort of bridge that gap a little bit. And I wouldn't have been given that opportunity if not for Rick. And he actually, you know, increased my pay, you know, mm-hmm. imagine that in radio, it doesn't right. always happen, <laughs> but he, he gave me opportunities like that. And he saw that I was willing to invest my time and wanted to grow. And so he was willing to invest in me too. I felt very supported by him. Yeah, it's it's good that neither of you had much interaction with him because you yeah. didn't want to. No. If <laughs> if you did have a lot of interaction with him, it was probably for a negative reason, you mm-hmm. know, unless you were in sales. Yeah. Or or in management. Um so that's not it's not somebody <laughs> I would hate to hear that somebody, "Oh yeah, yeah, I had lots of interaction with Rick." <laughs> uh okay, well Ooh. that probably wasn't good then, was it? No. No, it wasn't. In fact, it reminded me of a story that um 
and this may not be exactly how it went, but but his words were pretty memorable. Um, there was an individual that that was uh, that Sands and I were using um, for uh, for some work, contract labor, and um, this person ended up you know causing an issue or creating a problem, uh, and and it was a large enough problem where it got on Rick's radar, which you don't want to get on his radar. And so he pulled us in there and, um, and he essentially said, uh, I don't like problems. Mm-hmm. This problem needs to go away. Essentially saying this person, we need to be done using this person. And I mean, he just, he just stuff. said it in uncertain terms. Just, <laughs> oh, well, very certain terms, actually just, you know, I don't like problems. And so this problem needs to go away. Mm-hmm. And so that was it. I mean, it was just a very short conversation. Mm-hmm. He was very, very professional. Mm-hmm. It wasn't direct. Pers- very direct. It wasn't personal. It wasn't a, trying to offend anybody. Yeah. It was just, I don't like problems. Mm-hmm. And this person has become a problem. End we need to story. take him to the place that people don't talk yes, about. Yes, we need to disappear <laughs> this person. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. You mean unemployment? Yeah. No, <laughs> that's not what I'm, no, I, that's uh, not what I'm talking about. You know, Murray, I've got, I, I've got a question for yeah. you because it, it, 47 years invested in radio, I am a radio lifer. There's no way I'll get out of it, and I'm firmly convinced of that. But, and, and you've been engineering for a long time and hooked to the radio business, but if you were not in the business, would you do or would you choose to do something else? You know, to answer your question, if it was all to end today, because we could we could have a long conversation about where do we think it's headed that might be another episode. I'd love for you to come back and talk about that. Yeah, because that that there's 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 certainly different different avenues that it could yes. take, and it's going to be different for Glazer versus KV and E sure. versus Alpha versus Town Square. It's mm-hmm. going to be different for the big players versus the small players, and a lot of the small players are just going to shut down. You know, honestly, yeah. over time, they just can't sustain. But um, uh, I see Glazer staying in there for a while because his business model is really it appears to be um sustainable uh, sustainable yeah mm-hmm. yeah he's he's his approach on things is what i think all radios should still be doing but they're not um they're just taking the wrong approach but anyway yeah that that would be a, an interesting conversation but here's the thing is the technical people are the ones that get to ride the wave all the way to the very end that's true um the on air people are more at risk of being replaced by ai mm-hmm. um Music scheduling and traffic scheduling, uh, AI will mm-hmm. disrupt those, mm-hmm. uh, you know, those uh, positions. Uh, AI will disrupt the on-air positions. AI can disrupt the sales uh, departments. I can see more aggregate sales uh, coming into play. I mean, collusion can't take place, not supposed to take place legally, but, um, you know, agencies essentially are, mm-hmm. you know, uh, really cross that fine line with collusion because they're selling across multiple, you know, multiple stations, multiple groups. Right. Um, so I could see it getting to a point where, you know, stations just don't have, and, and, and I, you know, I'm not saying that this will happen or, um, uh, I'm not trying to paint a negative picture for sure. Forever. For anybody that may listen to this, I don't want, uh, I don't You're want, just painting a logical y- picture. Yeah. A logical picture for, yeah. I just don't see groups having their own sales staff long-term. Yeah, I see agencies just just taking over at that point and just selling across the groups, um, and, and and I might, might I might very well be wrong because I'm not a salesperson. I, I don't. That's one of the few departments in radio that I don't integrate that much with because it is uh, really relationship based between the AE and the uh, you know and the client. There's not a ton of technology you know right. in that in that relationship other than email. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying. Um, and so uh, that's one department that I just don't I don't swim that much in. But looking at it from a technical perspective, as it relates to AI, uh, yeah, I could see AI getting in uh, and algorithms getting brought into the mix in terms of selling, in terms of rate setting, and things like that. Mm-hmm. And in terms of the FCC uh, loosening some of the restrictions uh, um, and Federal Trade Commission as as it relates to collusion. Um, for the survival of radio, you know, uh, I think some of that's going to be important. Um, but it's, it has always proven itself to be true that technical rides the wave. And that is one reason why I'm still with the exact same stations that 
I've started with yeah. in the mid nineties. Uh, but I wake up every morning with that mindset of wanting to bring value to something. And so just in this conversation alone, mm-hmm. I think about what can I bring to this conversation uh, and not just sit here and be a boring person um, it, because I might be, I don't know, but uh, I just, I always want to make sure that I'm just contributing something, you know, in some way, whether it be a relationship or it be uh, a partnership or it be, uh, you know, a business meeting, uh, a decision that needs to be made, um, just some measure of value. I keep coming back to that word because that word is so important, I believe. And Marketplace deserves that from everybody is value. This was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, this was fun. Thank and you, I, Murray. And I would love to have another conversation about where we all three of us think the future is. This has been another episode of The Unknown Morning Show. I'm Mandy Montana. And I'm Chuck McKinley. This is our show to explore radio. Podcasting. Gear. And the gearheads that use the gear. And making money with a hot mic. And other stuff in between. We'd love for you to follow us on social media as well. Follow us on Facebook at The Unknown Morning Show. And Instagram at The Unknown Morning Show. See us on YouTube at The Unknown Morning Show. Thank you for listening to The Unknown Morning Show. I'm Mandy Montana. I'm Chuck McKinley. And And remember, be kind and rewind.